So I'd like to introduce the next speaker, the next gentleman who will introduce the, the topics at hand. His name is Courtney White. He shared a little bit yesterday. He's a founder of the Kavera Coalition and increasingly a storyteller as he's been going around and finding these positive stories of people who are living regeneratively and is sharing them in ways that are beautiful and powerful. Courtney, I'd love to invite you up to the stage. <laughs> Come on down, sir. <laughs> All right, Peter directly. P Peter Bick, who is going to be sharing a bit more about the media orientation of uh, some of the, the topics of this afternoon, and is the director and producer of Carbon Nation, which is one of the more powerful films related to holistic management being practiced on land. Peter, where are you? There you are. Hello. So we might want to bring this guy up. Um, Alan, thank you for having us, having me, having everybody, <laughs> and everybody, and Daniela, and the whole gang. Um, it was really good to jump off a plane yesterday and land here in this, in this group and hear all the things that we were hearing yesterday. And uh, I really enjoyed John, John uh, Liu's work. Uh, it was just astounding how, well here you're walking in right when I'm saying his name. It was just astounding how, when I see pictures of how nature is working, it just makes me feel so good. Uh, it's not a thought process, I just feel so good. And I just, watching his footage, did that. And uh, so I wanted to thank him for, for that work. We're gonna, um, we're gonna show a, a short film, it's 12 minutes. And then I'll talk a, a bit more after that. And, and uh, so let's see if the audio is happening. Yep, audio is happening. So we got it up. And is there a way to bring down the lights? There we, as much as you can. Awesome. Thank you. Here you go. bold ranchers who got the guts to change when nature forced their hand. When my wife and I went through the four years of crop failure, you know, I'm sure I was not a pleasant man to be around in that it was extremely high stress. We got into financial problems and, and couldn't make payments and the bank figured we should uh, sell the land and keep doing what we were doing with the big machinery with less land but we dug a hole faster. But my wife and I will tell you the best thing that could have happened to us. Because what it was, it forced us to start looking at the soil. Since the 1800s, letting cattle roam freely for weeks and months was second nature. Well, this will be a very typical conventionally grazed situation and where they're allowed to just keep returning back to the exact same area day after day to graze. 
but then you start getting cows eating the same plant all the time and then they go after the best ones and that weakens the root system on those so the poor plants take over. So we ended up with poor and poor pasture every year. With their pastures dying, Neil's wife insisted he take a class from someone teaching a new way to graze. I soon found out it was easier to go along and argue with her, so I went for the one day, but I didn't want to be there. So from 98 to 2004, I tried to prove him wrong, and I didn't have much luck. Everything started turning around when I started doing things different. I got different results. Results produced by grazing that regenerates the soil. Equal parts art and science with a splash of history. Our prairie soils were formed by large herds of bison, elk. They would move, they would graze an area and keep moving. And they might not return to that area for a year, maybe two years. To mimic this herd migration, they break up their ranches into small areas called paddocks. I'm going out to set up a temporary fence and make a small paddock of one acre or less. So I hang a bat latch on the permanent post and 12 feet away I found a temporary post and string my wire across and then I come back and put my step-in pigtails in. And then I go put electricity in the fence and that's it. I can put one up and down a quarter of a mile in 18 minutes. I'll put anywhere from, oh, 800 to 1,000 head on an acre or half an acre. The cattle readily move in to a new paddock because they always know they're going to get a fresh bite of grass. And what happens is that at higher stock densities, these cattle feel like things are a little competitive. They figure if I don't get it, my neighbor's going to get it. So they go ahead and grab and bite and grab and bite. In two to two and a half hours, it'll be either eaten or trapped on the ground. We graze it and then we get the heck off of it. It's ate off pretty good. You'll see some places are a bit shorter than others. The magic is how long to stay off. This is an 80 day recovery on this one right now. And that's where I think I need to be instead of anything less. For several decades, we sort of pushed monocultures in pastures. You know, plant just Bermuda grass or just fescue. Why? Because it was easy. You were managing for one species. You knew how to fertilize a monoculture. But when you manage a polyculture, a cocktail mix, then that's something that for today's generation is a little foreign. I'll take you down and show you that cocktail mix that I threw in so we get a picture of it before the cows eat it. This here is Black Medic. It's a legume and it puts down nitrogen. This species right here is called hairy vetch. Very high in protein. It'll be over 30% protein. And I got sunflowers, corn. This plant here is called Phacelia. That flower attracts the pollinators and we want the pollinators in our system. In many areas of the U.S. and in many areas globally, we're seeing a dearth of pollinator insects. And we have found that if we provide the habitat for pollinators, they will return. Okay, these are sow thistles, they're a weed. But if you eat them when they're just flowering or in the bud, early bud stage, they're higher protein than what the alfalfa is. My philosophy now is this. If livestock eat it, and it provides nutrition to those livestock, it's not a weed, it's a forage. Some guys might get the spray can out. They want to spray every weed there is. And the truth is, if I went in here and sprayed a herbicide to take care of these small amount of weeds that we have, I would also be taking care of my red clover, white clover, and all my other legumes in there and getting rid of those. And we're saving money. You know, we're not having to buy a herbicide, we're not having to employ machinery, you know, tractors and equipment to put it out as well. Why do I want to go out and spend thousands upon thousands of dollars every year on synthetic fertilizer when I can grow these crops for just the cost of the seed, they'll make the nitrogen for me, and then my livestock will come around and eat these plants, convert it to dollars for me to sell. So I'm getting all my fertilizer basically 
for a profit because I'm making money off of these crops. You know, these plants are just almost going nuts, so to speak, with photosynthetic activity once we take the cattle off. And that is allowing these plants as they're rapidly regrowing to capture carbon out of the air, you know, and put it back into the soil. Because of overgrazing, overuse of chemicals, and erosion, the amount of carbon in our soils is dangerously low. I think our whole world revolves around the carbon in the soil because it's those carbon molecules that feed soil life. And it's those microorganisms that feed all the plants, that nourish all the animals, that feed civilization. Many have thought restoring large amounts of carbon to soil would take centuries. These folks only need a decade, and maybe less. Last month we did soil tests on our operation and what we found is that we've over tripled the amount of organic matter, in other words, the amount of carbon stored in our soils. Carbon-rich soils soak up heavy rainfall. Carbon-depleted soils don't. When there was quite a bit of rain, the water would run down the hill and there would be water laying in the bottom of that slough. And now I get better water infiltration. That doesn't happen to me anymore. In 1993, we could only infiltrate one half inch of rainfall per hour. Now we can infiltrate over eight inches of rainfall per hour. Think of the ramifications of that. I tell people it's not how much moisture and rainfall you get, it's how much can your soils hold. Because carbon rich soils hold on to water, they help the ranchers weather droughts. This was seeded eight weeks ago and it's only seen 38 one hundredths an inch of rainfall. Yet look how healthy it is. The way that we graze these cattle and run these cattle, and with the health of the soil and the health of the plants that they're feeding on, they stay healthy. They don't get sick. They don't need to be treated. I used to carry a crossbow, three big bottles of medicine for treating them. And now out of the 850 head here, I've only treated uh, less than 20 this year. This particular farm here is about a thousand acres in size. And in terms of day-to-day -day activity, building paddocks for the week, moving cattle, you're looking at the person that does that on a day-to-day -day basis. I've got more spare time on my hands than I know what to do with. I do a lot of thinking of how to do all these things easier. If I was to start this when I was your age, you know what would have happened? I would have had 15 kids by now because I spend so much time in the house. You know, this is always the best part of my day. I guess one of the reasons I'm content is because you clearly see their content. You know, they're happy. We're still here after 10 or 15 years, and uh, we wouldn't have been if, if we'd have kept doing what we were. I'd have been flipping hamburgers somewhere. It's extremely low stress because we're working with nature instead of against her. My mother didn't think much of it when I first started it. She was pretty upset seeing all the weeds. Now she's bra <laughs> bragging to her friends about what I'm doing.
Thank you very much. I, I've had such an amazing journey being on this journey. I, I, I've had such, I'm giving myself a timer because I want to make sure I'm right on time with these guys. Um, you know, I, I, when the team came together to, to start making Carbonation, our goal was to make a, a, a film about solutions to climate change. And our tagline is a climate change solutions movie that doesn't even care if you believe in climate change. And it took us as long to make the tagline as it did to make the movie. And it was really in response to my uncle Phil sending me climate denier articles the whole time I was making Carbonation. And we really wanted to make a film that would show benefits to everyone, no matter what they thought about what is clearly a, you know, a poisoned well in the, in the, in the, uh, in the talk about climate. And so, in that film, we found that land was the biggest potential solution to getting carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, yet, in that film, in the in credits, I, I talk about meatless Mondays. I still thought that eating meat was, was detrimental to the planet. Um, and as we were doing the research for this film, and all the work that I'd done, getting connected with Savory, getting connected even more connected with the Marin Carbon Project, they're in the first film, getting connected with the Grass-Fed Exchange and HMI and all the people that are working on this, this giant team of different nodes of giant teams, um, I realized the, the incredible benefit of, of, of grazing as a solution and cover crops and no-till and all these things that can take what's been such a huge problem over the last century and make such a huge solution. And I'm, I'm always um, surprised when I meet people who have entrenched beliefs that don't have an openness to the next belief. Um, and so it's been really interesting communicating these ideas to people who think that this is absolutely just impossible. And I'm talking people on the left, people on the right. They're, you know, it, it's, it's across the board that this concept of grazing as a solution, it's very, very foreign to most people. There, there's two papers that came out in the last week. I mentioned them a little bit yesterday. One is showing the huge carbon footprint of beef production compared to any other protein production. And, um, you know, it, it's talking about things as they are, the conventional ways. And, and yeah, there, there's some definite, definite... Um, huge room for improvement with conventional agriculture right now. And I spoke to the lead scientist, uh, this guy, uh, Guidon, for that paper. Uh, I spoke to him, I guess it was Thursday on the phone, while I was driving to the airport to fly here. And he was so, he, he's vegan, so the idea that cows is a solution is, is already hard for him to, to get his head around. He studied agriculture for 10 years, he was a climate scientist before that, and he grew up in a kibbutz on a dairy farm in Israel, so he, he knew everything. He knew cows, he knew climate, he knew agriculture. And I would just wait, let him talk for a bit, then I would say some more, let him talk for a bit, and then I described to him the work that we want to do, the work that's on the end credit here. Um, you know, so as, a, as we were making this film, I, I had a lot of questions. Is carbon being stored in the soil? How much? How deep? Is it the stuff that's going to stick around? Is it fixed? Or is it the stuff that's going to float around that's just good to have in your system, but it ain't going to slow down climate change? You know, and then I learned about nitrous oxide and methane and those emissions from these systems and, and nematodes and, and the mycorrhizal fungi. And although the mycorrhizal fungi is in carbonation, we have a nice little cartoon. And, um, and beneficial bacteria and all these things that I, I was just, I, I love learning. So it was just this amazing last 18 months of my life. And, and I was meeting scientists as I was doing the research who were in different universities, USDA agencies and things like that, who were focused on one of those things, the methane or the, or the entomology, the bugs or the grazing systems. And they all were incredibly excited by what they're seeing on these ranches in the US and around the world. And they wanted to study their specific specialty on these ranches, but they were marginalized. They weren't being given the funding. Uh, they weren't really being given the time of day to be talking about it. And one scientist that I met, David Johnson, who's working on, he's doing amazing work. He's basically showing that if the soil carbon is up above 5%, that the plant is actually feeding the system completely. 
knowing it's going to get everything back. And I know I just said knowing like a plant knows, and I mean to say that from his work. And he actually has to pay for his own research. He, he hasn't been able to shake the money tree at New Mexico State to even get the money. Um, and every one of these scientists that I met on the phone were all saying the same thing, really excited about what's going on with these ranching systems, really want to study my specialty there, my hands are tied. And so I, I asked a very naive question, well, what do you need? And they gave me the typical answer, which I'm sure you guys can figure out, money. And, and it's not like I'm writing checks uh, yet, but um, it just made sense. So, so we found out about this grant from the NSF that basically talks about it's coupled natural human systems. And I thought, well, this is a coupled natural human system. Let's, let's do that. So I emailed all the scientists. And within two hours, I emailed them to say, hey, do you want to work on this grant with me? Who's never done a grant before in any way, or shape, or form like this. Within two hours, they all emailed back with exclamation points saying, count me in. Absolutely. And I remember saying to my wife, Krishna, something just happened. Something just happened. These folks are so excited to work on this. Something just happened. And we realized that the grant, we didn't have enough time to really work it out. But I got to talking to the folks at Arizona State and, and, and my schools of the School of Sustainability and the School of Journalism. And I said something just, and I had been talking to them about this as a solution to climate change, because that's what our school's all about. And, and you know, the potential for the soil and the potential for carbon into the soil. And so we all agreed, let's bring all these scientists to ASU and, and see what happens. So we got them all there in January. And correct me if I'm wrong, two of them are here, or at least I, know, I see Richard. I don't know if Jason's in the room right now, if he's uh, out and about exploring London. There he is. Um, it seemed to be for the first time in all their careers, they were able to sit around in a table of scientists and not have to defend themselves where they actually could just say what they believed and, and listen to the next person. And we formed a team. Um, and so many things have happened from that one meeting that are very exciting, but the bottom line is we are gonna do system science on ranches in nine different ecosystems, nine different areas of the United States and Southern Canada where the rainfall's different, the soil's different, the, the latitude's different, the longitude's different. And that's our game plan. And, and so we're, we're very excited about this. We're early days. Um, we're mapping it out. We've just found out we've got 30 ranches signed up. Now, it's easy to get the holistic managers to sign on, right? How do you get the conventional grazers to sign on and be honest? Because you've got to be honest. How do you say to someone, we think you could be doing it better. We'd like to study your ranch. And so what we're doing, and this is, this is where Richard Teague just, I think, made a brilliant call. In those nine regions, we're doing three ranches. We're going to do the holistically managed ranch. We're going to do a very well-run conventional grazing system and a poorly run conventional grazing system. It's that poorly run that's going to be tricky, right? Well, we've already got just about all the ranchers signed up on all those systems. Another team member of ours is a guy named Alan Williams who's in the movie. He's wearing the earpiece that I forgot to tell him to take out. Uh, for most of the time I was filming them the first day. Anyway, so Alan's a big player in the grass-fed exchange, as is Jason, as is Gabe Brown, as a matter of fact. And so this thing's moving forward, and, and we will share all of our data with everyone. That's the game. This is open source to, to the T. Um, so we'll be measuring all the data. We're going to be measuring rainfall infiltration. We're going to be measuring moisture content in the soil. All of it. Everything everyone's been talking about. And it's going to be messy. And, you know, we're going to... I don't know, Richard, do you think after year one we could start saying what we're finding without drawing conclusions, but just saying, hey, here's what we found in these side-by-side -side tests? But we're thinking it's a three-year three -year, uh, research program. Um, yeah, we can. And, and here's a really cool another piece to the, to the puzzle. Um, so thinking about soil into the carbon, thinking about the potential, um, is, it's always been in my mind since I was at John Wick's ranch for, who, who started the Marin Carbon Project back in 07, which is what opened my eyes to this stuff. And he's doing Alan's methods. If you can sequester carbon in the soil, what industry is spending the most money trying to sequester carbon mechanically 
and that's the fossil fuel industry, and, and specifically the oil industry, and specifically uh, companies like Shell. And so, as I was getting ready, as I was starting filming this film, I was actually on a ranch in Kentucky, uh, a farm in Kentucky, and I got hooked up with a guy named Russ Conser, who was running at the time Shell Game Changer, which is an internal venture capital fund within Shell to take crazy ideas that could change the game for an energy company, but they're so crazy that, you know, it, there's no way to really make it happen at a company like Shell that can't get out of bed for less than $50 million. So they have this other division. So Russ um, and I spoke on the phone. I'm looking at a bunch of cattle. And I said, are you familiar with uh, grass-finished beef? And he said, yes. As a matter of fact, uh, I eat that because I'm worried about my health. My, I lost my dad a couple years ago. And as I studied his health and my health, I'm down this road. So the foundation that spoke right before lunch is right in his wheelhouse. And I said, are you familiar with, with uh, rotational grazing with Alan Savory? And he goes, I was just in the front row at his TED talk a couple of weeks ago. This was about a year and a half ago. I said, great. Are you familiar with the carbon sequestration possibility of these systems? He said, no. I said, you guys are doing a project called Quest up in Canada. It's a big carbon capture and sequestration project with the Alberta government. Um, it's $1.2 billion. And right now, it's going to cost them, if they get it, if they get it, um, it'll be $60 a ton to capture CO2 and put it in the salt deposits way down. And he said, can you get me data? Can you get me data to prove what you can do versus what we're talking about doing? Because we're a data-driven company. And that led us down the road that brings me to here, and it brought me to Richard. Um, Nancy Ranney, who, who is here, I've been, I was looking for who's measuring, who's measuring, who's measuring, how are they measuring, how are they measuring? And she got me in touch with Steve Affelbaum, who has a company called Applied Ecosystem Services. And they've got a protocol. It's based on the, the Washington Palouse. Um, so, Chad, if you're still around, I don't know if you've worked with Steve, but I'm sure your paths have crossed. And, but their protocol hasn't been used for grazing systems. So it's, it's brand new. This, this stuff is brand new. These scientists are on the cutting edge, uh, bleeding edge. And so Russ and I together went to Shell to get to see if we could get a Game Changer grant. It happened to be that Russ was retiring after 32 years, and this was the last thing he did at Shell was pitch that grant. And we pitched it last August. We got awarded in October, and we started the research here in London in March. Shell broke it down into four questions. Shell basically said, is it real? Are you really sequestering carbon in the soil that's going to stay there for long enough to affect climate. Can you scale it? Is it scalable? Great question. How fast can you scale this? How many ranchers and grazers and farmers could come on board and how fast? And those are daunting numbers, by the way. And then number four, can it create value? Can Shell make money from that or save money from that? And they decided to give us, we showed them Richard's data. And so we, Russ almost feels like we did too good of a job answering question one, is it real? So we couldn't get the money to do that research, which is what we really want. <laughs> and so they basically said, one, two, and three, let's just act like those are real. We're going to ask you guys to do research on four. Can Shell make money from soil going into the carbon, uh, from carbon going into the soil? I know I flipped that. There might be something there. Um, <laughs> So through my being at Arizona State University and, and a really, really, really nice deal that Carbon Nation, a 501c3, has with Arizona State University Foundation, a 501c3, we convinced Shell to give us a grant with no strings attached. It's not Shell paying for research. It's Shell giving us money to do what we want to do. So it's open source. It can't go on a shelf at the company and not be seen by anybody. And that's, I didn't realize how big a deal it was that we got that, but as I talked to more and more people from Shell, they're shocked, Shell shocked. And, <laughs> and so we got that. So everything we're learning about business creation around taking advantage of carbon going in the soil, we're gonna just, it's, it's gonna be open, open book, open source. So we're in the middle of that right now. We just had a great midterm team meeting up in Colorado in Grand Lake, AKA Spirit Lake, if you're older than 100 years old. And we've come up with 20 business models, and there's some pretty interesting ones there. And we're going to be pitching to Shell throughout the fall and see if they take them. My goal is that Shell then sees they have good business opportunities for getting 
carbon in the soil because they need to sequester carbon. It's one of their biggest priorities is sequestering carbon. They know that. And we've been told that our project is now becoming a, a, a higher priority at, at the game changer level, which is great. Um, so I want Shell to come in and, and help pay for this research. You know, they have big checkbook. Um, but imagine, imagine if you could go to a gas station and put gas in your car knowing that it's carbon negative, knowing that that company has actually helped get enough ranches and farms into a healthy system, sharing the credits with the ranchers and farmers that the ranchers and farmers are happy about, not something where they're going to be taken advantage of. That's me being naive again. I admit that, but that's my goal. Um, imagine that, right? You know how on some air, uh, you go someplace and they say, we proudly serve Starbucks coffee. You've seen that like a different, not at Starbucks, obviously they do, but you know, when you, when you go on an airline or someplace like that. Imagine that kind of branding for something that's actually real, for carbon negative fuel. Just imagine that. I'm not going to ask you to clap, but I kind of want you to. Um, not that, I was thinking just the one clap, not the applause. Um, so that's, that's also what we're working on. Um, but the science is key. We have to have the data. And, and so that's, that's the game plan. That's, that's where we're spending just an enormous amount of time. These films are part of that. Um, the films are part of the science. The science is about data, it's about humans, it's about ranchers. Why are ranchers changing? Why aren't some not, you know, why are some not changing? We talked a lot about that yesterday. And, and so the films, we're going to use the films to show, to let ranchers speak to ranchers. That's the name of the game. There's actually a group in California called Rancher to Rancher. Joe Morris runs it. That's the name of the game, to get as many ranchers talking to as many ranchers, as many farmers talking to as many farmers. So if we can make short films that we can get out there. We've got a lot more footage with these characters. I'm shooting a lot more footage right now. I just met a bunch of young, I just met a bunch of young ranchers who were filming, I was filming in, in Kansas. Last thing I'm gonna say is very interesting. So that pond that happened when the soil wasn't absorbing, well, a lot of ranchers have those ponds and a lot of young ranchers who are going towards these techniques are building their paddocks around their ponds. Then they're getting their soil healthy and the ponds are disappearing because the water's not sitting in a pond anymore, it's infiltrating into their soil. So it's this neat little problem they're having in their transition. And I, you know, who'd have thought, I wouldn't have thought of that. But um, so, so it's very complicated, it's very interesting, it's very fun to see these young guys going after this. And again, it's been a great honor to be here. I'm just so glad that to see this and to know what's happening around the world. And, and now we've got Graham Harvey coming up, so let me help you get your computer going. So thank you very much. I'm going to plug. Graham what's, Graham, what's the name of the film you sent me about the young farmer who's transitioning right now? It's, um, Tim, what's it called? Oh, I've got it. It's One Man, His Mutt, and His Mud. And uh, the guy, the man in that is here. No dog, I'm afraid. Uh, no mud. It was really, but, uh, it was really good. It's um, uh, great to be here. I, I feel kind of awkward coming in after all that stuff about cutting edge because I don't do cutting edge very well. But Chris asked me if I put it all in a British context, everything we've been discussing here. So that's what we're going to try and do, which actually means I'm going to give you a brief overview, a brief history of grazing in Britain. And because I've only got 15 minutes, I'm going to start 450,000 years ago. <laughs> Round at the Natural History Museum, they've got an exhibition where they explore the origins of human ancestors on this patch of ground we call Britain. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. That's better. Forget the pictures you've just seen. <laughs> And it goes back a lot further than they used to think. From assemblages of animal bones, uh, they found that there have been human occupations or human-like occupations on this land, on and off, 
uh, missing out the odd ice age for 450,000 years. So we've been grazing a long time. We've been eating the foods of grazing animals for a long time. I'm going to jump ahead to the Neolithic. The first farmers in Britain, about five and a half thousand years ago, were actually nomadic herders. Nomadic herders of cattle and pigs and sheep. And although they did grow grains, they didn't stay. They didn't stay on those settled pots, plots. They moved on. And they moved on in kind of uh, cycle rather like, you know, all nomadic peoples. <clears throat> and I'll move on to feudal times. We're in history now, so we're getting on at a great pace. Our first global export trade in Britain was based on pasture and grazing. And that was the wool trade. And all the hills, all the valley grasslands, all the mountain sides were covered in sheep in about the 13th century. And that wool was the crop thereafter. And it all went to Flanders, and some of it went to Italy. And it was a great global trade. And some of the great British churches are founded on that trade, the wool trade. And it was a trade that was taken part in by big landowners, many of whom were monasteries, but also small peasant farmers. And, to this, and the wealth of the wool trade actually allowed British monarchs to go and fight the French and the, the Spanish. And to this day, in the House of Lords, I think it's the Lord Chancellor, actually sits on the wool sack. It's a sack of wool. And it's to represent that great wealth that came from grassland in the 13th century. And then we jump ahead to Tudor Britain, time of Shakespeare. Grassland and grass-fed foods were a, a, a main part, not only for the, the diet, not only for the wealthy, but also for the peasants. And you know, peasant farmers, when their, gra when their grain crops failed, well, they didn't grow grain crops, but when bread was too expensive, they had the house cow to provide the family with the kind of foods that we heard this morning were really healthy. Uh, and then we come to the 19th century, it's a whistle-stop tour through British history. We, it was the age of the great improvers, and that's where uh, British uh, animal breeders bred the great grazing uh, animals that went around the world. I'm talking about the Shorthorn, the Hereford, the best of all, which is the Devon, which comes from my part of the country, and uh, the, Ayrshire, the Ayrshire cow. <laughs> um, and because, so that's our tradition of grazing in Britain. And because of that, as you see, I'm a very old person. I grew up on grass-fed foods, as we all did. And in our family, we had no money. It was a, uh, the post-war years, there was a lot of austerity. Food was still rationed. But we still had beef. And I suspect that beef uh, was not British. I suspect it came from Argentina because it came from the co-op butcher at the end of our road. And at that time, they were buying beef from Argentina. But what this means is it was grass-fed because it probably came from those great pampas grasslands in, in that part of the world. And our butter came from New Zealand, again grass-fed, hopefully on the Canterbury Plains. The food we knew was local was our milk. We had, uh, and I knew it was local because in Reading where I lived, our milk, most of our milk, half the town was supplied by a dairy which had been set up by a farmer in the 1920s when farm prices were rock bottom. And a lot of uh, dairy farmers at that time, to make a living, to keep going, they started retail rounds. And in those uh, mid years between the wars, there was a great explosion of fresh milk production. It was driven by entrepreneurial dairy farmers who started up retail rounds. <clears throat> so that's the preamble. All that's gone. We now have scientific agriculture in place of that. <clears throat> And our chief scientists, although we've, we've got scientific agriculture and we've had it for 30 years or 40 years, our chief scientist, our ex-chief scientist, John Bennington, says uh, the system failed. We need new technologies. We actually need a new paradigm for food production because otherwise we're all going to go hungry. Well, I can tell him he doesn't have to bother. You've seen this picture, unfortunately, because that's it. That's the new way to produce food. You can find that picture in the National Gallery. That's Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. He's a, a wealthy banker. She's the daughter of a wealthy banker. So some things in life don't change. <laughs> but it was, painted, it was painted by Thomas Gainsborough in 1750. Thomas Gainsborough is much more interested in landscapes than he was of people. So although he took commissions to paint these two, he insisted they go and be painted in their estate. And he's actually, I've seen the picture, it's in the National Gallery, he's actually devoted more of the space to the landscape, because that's what interests him, than to Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, delightful though they seem. <laughs> but the interesting thing to me 
as uh, an, uh, a grazing freak is that this is a mixed farm landscape. And we know, it's, you know he's a very modern-minded farmer because he's using a new corn drill. You see the drills of wheat there, harvested wheat. But in the background is a field of grazing sheep. And over to the left, uh, there's some grazing animals in what looks like an orchard. I've been to the National Gallery, and I've gone as close as I can without sitting the laptop, and I can't work out whether they're deer or they're cattle, but perhaps somebody can tell me that. <clears throat> well, uh, that system started in the mid-18th century. That's 1750. Two, that was North Essex that we just saw. This is 200 years later in North Essex, so not a very good picture. Uh, and I apologise for that. It was taken from 10,000 feet by the Luftwaffe, and they thought they were about to be shot down. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> <laughs> but it was when Hitler was thinking of invading Britain, he decided he'd need the whole of Britain aerially mapped so that he could know where all the uh, military bases were. And they took tens of thousands of pictures from 10,000 feet, and that's one of them. And that's the part of, similar part of the world to the earlier picture you saw. And hardly anything's changed. That is a landscape for producing healthy food. That's why nothing's changed in the 200 years. <clears throat> And there's a, a, a great book called uh, The History of the Countryside by a chap called Oliver Rackham. And he says, at that time in 1940, Sir Thomas More would have recognised a lot about that landscape. And Emperor Claudius would have recognised quite a lot about that landscape. And in my time, as a working journalist, it's all gone. <clears throat> um, but I grew up eating grass-fed foods, and when I was a farm student, agriculture student, farms I worked on were mixed farms. We produced milk like this. And uh, it was a mixed farm in Berkshire, the first farm I worked on. Had a dairy herd, 40 or 50 cows. They ran grass most of the year. Uh, and in the winter, uh, they got silage, which is just uh, fermented grass. And I remember grazing. We grazed them on uh, kale, things like that. And at that time, there were 120,000 dairy farmers in Britain producing milk that way. There's uh, nine out of ten of them have gone now. So there we have it, scientific agriculture. <clears throat> you know all about this. Those are the foods that we eat from scientific agriculture. Uh, we have the scientific recommendations of the right foods to eat, and it's, we heard about it this morning, very starchy. Not, the, uh, not too many of the foods we've been eating for 450,000 years. And that's what we do with our animals that were on grass. And we feed them maize on soya. And uh, that's the result of that. Uh, this, this, uh, this, I live on a village on Exmoor, which is um, a high part of the west of England. It's where the Devon cattle come from. Uh, but that's a picture taken in a lane leading to our village in summer after a fairly heavy rainstorm. And you can see the color of the soil. It's washed, the water that's washing down, that's the soil. That's the river Tone that runs through my local town of Taunton in normal conditions, and I hope you can see the difference. There is a big difference. That's, that's after about two hours of, hours of rain. And that's silt washing off the field, fields, and it all, after it goes through Taunton, it goes across the Somerset levels where it drops all its silt, and we know the result of that. That's Mike Harrington, who uh, is a great soil expert, and uh, for about 20 years, he's also an agronomist, and agronomists are people that tell arable farmers what chemical sprays to put on next. But he knows his soil so well, after 20 years of doing this, he says, we've got to find another way because the soils are shot and the chemicals don't work anymore. <clears throat> That's a mixed farm landscape. Um, uh, we know what that is. <clears throat> this is uh, uh, where I live. I'm not a proper farmer, but we've got a three-acre paddock next to our house. Uh, and it's so steep, uh, it's full of gorse, it's so steep, no one's ever dared go on it with a tractor. The locals call it the cliff, and uh, that's the kind of thing it grows. And, you know, 50 years ago, every field on every pasture field on next wall would be full of those things. And those are the things that put nutrients in the meat that we eat. Things like CLA and all the omega-3s, and the balance of omega-6 fats and omega-3s. Um, you know, grass is good, but when the grass contains all those things, all these things, good things, are boosted. So, you know, for 400,000 years, everybody's been getting the benefit of these nutrients in their food, and now for two generations, they haven't been. Uh, those are Montbelliard cows in France, in the Jura Mountains, where they know how to do things properly. They make a wonderful cheese called Comte cheese, and they only use that breed, dual-purpose breed. 
They fill their pastures with the kind of things uh, you saw in the earlier slide, and they make fantastic unpasteurized cheese. Those are longhorn cattle, uh, and they're not related to Texas longhorn. I expect you know that. Uh, that's Tom Chapman, who's here somewhere. I hope if you haven't met him, you'll find him. He's got a great ambition to cover the arable plains of East Anglia with grazing cattle. So do say hello to Tom. And, um, and that's a bit of uh, mob grazing going on in uh, the Cotswolds. <clears throat> and uh, the, there's a guy there called Rob Richmond who's been practicing. He's, he's got a dairy herd. He does all the paddock system. And those are the kind of um, uh, pastures. And his neighbors look over the hedge and they think, yeah, what is this? He calls that a grazing paddock. But um, Tom, uh, Rob has found that over five years, he's increased the soil organic matter on these very poor Cotswolds soils by 2%. Now, of course, scientists don't believe it. But I believe Tom, because uh, Rob, because um, it used to work, so it always will. I'm going to finish now with... Um, that's Rob Richmond. Now, I guess some of you will know him. That's Mark McAfee in uh, Fresno in California, who sells unpasteurized milk. I'm going to finish with a story about unpasteurized milk. And I wrote about this in the Daily Mail on Monday, but does anyone here read the Daily Mail? Anyone going to admit to reading the Daily Mail? <laughs> well done. <laughs> Very brave man. <laughs> um, the story I wrote on, about unpasteurized milk involved someone called Arthur Hosier. I guess some of you will know this name. But in the 1920s, when dairy farmers were going bust, Arthur Hosier was a farmer engineer. Uh, and one of the reasons he saw farmer, dairy farmers were going bust, because prices had collapsed after World War I, and um, farmers' costs were too high. So he came up with this brilliant idea of keeping cows out on pasture all year round and milking them through a mobile milking, small mobile milking parlour. And he bought uh, a couple of thousand acres of really gorsy, worn out downland, chalk downland in Wiltshire, and he covered it with grazing cows in about 1922. And his neighbours thought he'd gone off his head. In 1927, he produced his results to the great and the good of British agriculture at the Farmers Club in London. And not only he'd made loads of profit because he'd halved his costs, he was selling his milk unpasteurized direct to customers. And he had sitting beside him the medical officer of health for Wiltshire. In those days, uh, local, you know, um, health, local health was administered on a county basis. And the medical officer uh, uh, congratulated him and, and declared that that milk was the cleanest, purest, safest in, in the whole of Wiltshire. And it was so good, a lot of it was actually sent to London to, to hospitals uh, for people who, whose immune systems were compromised. Um, a couple of years later, quite a few farmers went into this system. It was called, they called it outdoor dairying. Quite a few farmers went into this in the late 20s, early 30s. And Oxford University, Agricultural Economics Department, came down and did a study of this system. And they said, great, not only does it, not only does it produce really clean milk, the cows never got TB. TB was rife in the national herd. Cows never got it on this system. But not only that, you could put it on worn-out pastures, this kind of system. I don't know where they did rotational grazing, but the pasture productivity increased, increased dramatically. And the Oxford University economist said, this is the way ahead for British dairy farming. And if it had been, if they'd all adopted this system, I think we would live in a country where we wouldn't have cows in sheds. We'd have grass, pasture-fed milk, in every small locality in Britain. But we didn't, and the reason we didn't, I, I wondered what happened to Arthur Hosier, because his system, having been quite well known in the 1930s, has really been airbrushed from history. And he was actually bought up by Express Dairies, and they shut the whole thing down. And I suspect he tried to get it out there, but Express Dairies uh, put a stop to it. And the reason was, uh, there was a lot of really dirty milk in those days, because hygiene standards were rubbish. And um, there was a great campaign driven by the big dairy companies to make it uh, compulsory for all milk to be pasteurized. What this would mean is most farmers wouldn't be able to cope with this, so it would have to go to the factory to be treated to make fit for people to drink. And that was the way the dairy industry could take control. 
Arthur Hosier showed, I mean, he, he, his brilliant system, this is 1920s, had a generator on it, had a lighting system on it, had a refrigeration system on it. He could take milk straight from the cow into the churn without it being exposed to the air, and then he sold it locally. That system was perfect. It's exactly what Mark McAfee's now doing in, in Fresno in California. When I, I last, I spoke to him a couple of times on the phone when I last heard he was selling unpasteurizing, having a constant fight with the US health authorities, They're the same as they are here, and, um, but he was selling to 75,000 consumers unpasteurized milk. And to end on a positive note, uh, that's something like Arthur Hosey's system, and there's a guy called Nick Snellgar down on the Hampshire borders who's developed this system. He's also developed a small-scale on-farm pasteurization system if, you know, for people who can't sell unpasteurized milk. But basically, we could have grass-filled milk everywhere in Britain. It just needs a few young entrepreneurs like Tim to put that system on their farm so we can have proper milk. So I'll leave it there. That's the history. I'm going to hand over to uh, Tim May, who's going to talk about the future. Thank you. Uh, Peter. I need to, oh, that one. Don't know. How do I get the um, screens over? Yeah. Oh, shit. Can we have a bit of technical assistance here? I'm sorry about this. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> I just need to get the other PowerPoint. I can't even get back to the desktop. Yeah. Is this yours? Yeah, get rid of that. Get back to desktop if you could. Oh, close that. Oh, that wasn't showing up a minute ago. So uh, we're just um, just waiting for the PowerPoint job, but uh, I'll catch up. So I, I've been asking my uh, my friends and, and, and neighbours around us: Is uh, is graze grass the most essential arable crop? And my answer for this is yes. Our current model for lowland agriculture is crops, crops, and more crops. And this is pretty boring. It's also unsustainable. We're destroying the habitats for our wildlife, fighting a growing list of persistent weeds and diseases, working harder and harder, and harder each year to find the inflation-beating growth in our businesses. And all the while, we disregard the one thing that supports us all, our soil. We need to shift our mindsets from mono to multi. Our current reduction of mindset follows a monocropped, mono land use, monoculture regime. We have to change to a more complex, interdependent style of agriculture, one that thrives on diversity, multi-cropping, multi-land use, multi-people. That must be our new maxim. Where else do we hear the less the merrier? It's all about more. When we increase biodiversity, we increase biomass or plant cover which in turn increases photosynthesis, or the conversion of sunlight into carbohydrates, which increases carbon uptake and the manufacture of oxygen, which increases the accumulation of organic matter, which destroys nutrient cycling, which increases soil fertility, 
all of which, ultimately, increases our production and reduces our exposure to expensive pests and disease breakdowns. Who wouldn't want this? Oh, I think I might be able to drive this now. There we go. Who wouldn't want this? I've been back on our family estate in Hampshire since 2004. After successive years of financial loss, we'd sold off our dairy unit and closed the pig enterprise. I was left with a thousand hectares of arable land to farm, while Dad worked on the other areas of the business. He was already playing with direct drilling and minimal tillage, and had sold all the ploughing equipment. The motivation for this wasn't agronomic, it was more economic. We could easily change the plough points on our ploughs every four hours, and changing tyres on our tractors every year was the norm. We needed a system that moved as little soil as possible. We couldn't afford to do anything else. It was only later on that I learned more of the agronomic benefits of this style of farming. About that time, I needed to appoint a new agronomist. I found a chap so passionate about soil that it becomes infectious. This is uh, Mike Harrington that, um, that uh, Graham was talking about. I'm continually amazed by his assertion that many of our problems are born from so poor soil conditions, in particular soil biology and soil nutritional balance. If we can correct these problems, then we will be well on the way to a sustainable future. Now, when I follow this line of thought, I can see that many of our social problems are because of poor farming. And it's exciting for me to think how much impact proper farming could have. Reducing our NHS bills, cutting prison numbers, basically producing a brighter, healthier population. We might even get to the point when we can proudly say that farming delivers. It's common sense, really, but we're never taught this at university. We're taught if you've got a fungal attack, you need a fungicide. Now we're even taught you've got to use a fungicide because of the certainty of a fungal attack. No one ever teaches you've got a fungal attack because your system's screwed. <laughs> and in human terms, it's like saying you've got a headache because you haven't taken enough paracetamol. <laughs> so to find this holy grail of high yielding, easy to grow healthy produce, I need to build organic matter. I've done test after test and found more and more problems in my soils. But strangely enough, the solution is always build more organic matter. I thought I was doing all the right things. Direct drilling, leaving straw on the fields, spring cropping, using sludge and compost, everything that I'd expect to help, but it still wasn't enough. The black grass still grew, and the slugs still chewed. It took the adventure of a Nuffield scholarship to give me the strength to make some more radical adjustments to the farm. A Nuffield scholarship is an international program run by farmers for farmers. They look for the future leaders and innovators and give them a bursary to go out into the world and come back with something new. They must present their findings in a report and a talk at the annual conference. But it's much more than that. It's about personal development, about finding the leader within you and learning that there's a massive life outside of the farm gate. After convincing my wife that this was a good idea, I went off on an amazing journey. I went to the US, to Brazil, to Kenya, and to Tanzania in search of a new direction for my business. I talked to farmers and land managers and looked at a range of production systems, from avocados to rubber, pineapples to coffee, always asking the same question. What makes you different from your neighbours? Sustainability was the overriding theme, and this was to prove the core focus of my business going forward. My report was titled Understanding and Implementing Sustainability, and I focused particularly on economic sustainability. If I could sum up my work in one sentence, it would be 
We need sound business businesses that can outperform the compounding of flex inflation before we concentrate on social and environmental enhancement. Africa brought this conclusion out to me. The environment there is suffering because there's no surplus of time or energy. Everyone's living for today with little regard for tomorrow. But where there is slightly more wealth in the area, the level of environmental degradation reduced. And to me, this is because all money is a claim on human labor. Yes. Yes. Thank you. If we owe money, we have to work. If we have money, we can pay someone else to work for us or buy a machine. It's that simple. We need that surplus of time and energy so that we can consider tomorrow. I can't see how we can achieve that with our current model. We've got flat yields, ever more challenging pest and disease problems, and the solutions always require oil derivatives, the costs of which grow with inflation, while our commodity prices are subject to the rule of diminishing returns. The more reliant on oil we become, the more of a losing battle arable farming is. Inflation is a compounding problem requiring exponential growth. For every percent of inflation, we must grow our business by the same amount. Otherwise, we shrink our reserves and lose our profits. At 3%, we need to double our profits every, three, every 20 years, just to stand still. But is today's 3% inflation the true level? I don't think it is. For me to make more money year on year, I need to reduce my reliance on fossil fuels. My understanding of soil suggests this is entirely possible. And it all starts with organic matter. The quickest way I have found to grow organic matter is the reintroduction of grazed grass. I've known this for years without knowing it, and it was highlighted to me by two fellow Nuffield scholars, Rob Richmond and Tom Chapman. Rob wrote a fantastic report on soil carbon, and his grassland management, as we've just heard, is having a major, amazing results in improving soil organic matter. Um, I've got 1% in four years, you say 2% in five years. Anyway, it's doing well. It's totally impossible in arable farming. Then Tom Chapman did a fascinating report on mog grazed cattle and a system that fits grazed grass into an arable rotation. Rob's report told me what I had to do and Tom's told me how to do it. So in May uh, 2013, we planted 360 hectares of the farm down to a herbal lay. Sorry. Ah, as we go. Grass had to be the answer. It's what farmers did before nitrogen. It's what we did before nitrogen. As you can see here, this is the 1950s. So we've got our, our pastured, pastured poultry. We've got our uh, mixed system, ploughing and sheep and outdoor pigs. Um, it's, it's all there. So that's what we were doing in the 1950s. And we forgot that. We couldn't grow crops there without three years of grass leading the way. And it's, pretty much, it's pretty hard to find much detail about these systems actually working here in the UK today. But the more examples I found of grass, mob grazing, holistic management, transforming far, farmland, the more I had to have a go. So I did. So in May uh, 2013, we planted 360 hectares of the farm down to a herbal lay. And we'll work towards the full half in the next couple of years. I'll be doing a four-year rotation of grass and then arable crops. And um, we're initially grazing that with sheep. And we'll move into a cattle system in the future. I found that sheep would be more forgiving on my soils in the early years, especially as I want to outwinter all the, all the stock. But cattle would do a much better job uh, of handling the large quantities of growth that I want. It's just one problem. I didn't know anything about sheep farming or beef farming. So as luck would have it, a local sheep farmer was retiring, so I managed to buy him out. But he's no ordinary sheep farmer. Before turning to farming, he worked at the Grassland Research Centre in Berkshire. He's been pretty much single-handedly outwintering his uh, 2,000 ewes and 2,500 lambs for the last 20 years. He was the perfect person to partner up with. I now own 1,700 ewes, 2,500 lambs, 150 cows, 100 pigs, 
uh, 42 rams, two sheepdogs, and I have a stunning mass of facial hair. You could say, I have all the gear and no idea. I think you'd be right. But we're learning fast. Here's the plan. We put a pasture down for four years. We move the stock over it, keeping them on one bit of ground for as short a time as possible. Then we rest it for as long a time as sensible before grazing it again, building tremendous amounts of organic matter, both above and below the surface. Then we use this facility to grow low-cost, high-yielding crops at great profit. I could go on, but I'm getting waved at. So I'm just going to come to one conclusion. The question, and how I'd like to conclude, is um, is grazed grass the most essential arable crop? I think it is. It's going to make me more resilient, more flexible. I'll be producing more nutritious food, taking more carbon out of the atmosphere, reconnecting my local community with the landscape and their diets, and pass on a business that will continue to grow and produce more and more from within its own boundaries. What other crop can do all of that? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Yes, it is. Thank God your phone is available. Um, so, so a couple of quick notes before we, we move on to the next speaker. One is just a little bit about the programming that you've been seeing here. There's a sentence that's coming to mind about what this, this gathering is all about. The first, it's a two-part sentence. So the first part of the sentence is, thinking holistically will regenerate the land. And the second part of the sentence is, and that's important because, dot, dot, dot. This place is a place that I see people agreeing on the first part of that sentence, and the second part people have different takes on. And that's okay. I'm just noticing in some of these conversations that I'm hearing throughout this time that there are disagreements on, well, why is it important for this reason versus this reason? And what you're seeing again and again is there's lots of reasons why regenerating the land is important. So with that as background, I wanted to just give a little bit of a lay of the land for the remaining part of the day. There's one more session that we have before a breakout period, and so I'll be introducing the next speaker shortly. And then we'll come back from the breakouts with a break, and then some closing conversations as we head towards the, uh, the closing of the conference. One quick note about something that you see outside, as you guys may head out to the breakouts, you'll notice some pictures across the foyer. Those pictures were sent in by the hub leaders across the world. There's about 20 different hubs, beautiful landscapes, diverse landscapes. Definitely check it out as you get a shot. And for those who are speakers for this gathering, as you leave, please remember to take one of those pictures as you exit because it is one of the gifts that we'd like to offer you as part of your involvement here. So uh, the next part of the, the conference schedule is focusing on the question of how the regeneration of land is connected to health. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Daphne Miller. She's a professor and a physician. She's connected to the University of California, San Francisco. She's a leading integral health pioneer, and she's the author of a book called Pharmacology, Pharmacology with an F, What Innovative Farming Can Teach Us About Health and Healing. Please welcome Daphne. So we're starting to understand in uh, medicine that sit time is an independent risk factor for health, health problems. And you guys have been doing a lot of sit time right now. So would you all stand up for one second, please? Oh, thank you. And just stretch. Okay. I think you're allowed to sort of recharge your sit time after you stand up. You're allowed a another 40 minutes. So sit down whenever you want to, but thank you. You, you just made me feel better, OK? <laughs> so we have the slides up there. I, I just like a show of hands quickly. How many of you believe in the age-old adage, food is medicine? A lot of you. OK, good, good. Then I came to the right place. 
because my job in the next 40 minutes is to convince you that that's not quite right. <laughs> in fact, it's not food as medicine. It's farm as medicine. And it's all the places, wild or managed, where our food is grown that offers us the real medicine. And hopefully, I will all, we'll all be on the same page by the end of the talk. So who's this lady up here on the podium talking to you about farms who spends her day in an eight by 10 room that's neon lit, you know? And actually, I have a couple patients here in the room so they can attest that this is indeed where I spend my days. But here's the problem. I've spent my career training to work within these parameters and more and more over the years, I was getting preoccupied with dirty thoughts, literally, thinking about soil. I'd sit there in this cubicle and I would think, how are my patient's health connected to the soil? So I did what any good academic would do and I went to PubMed, which is the premier medical research engine for looking at medical research and looking at literature. And I put in the words, human health and soil. Guess what I got back? Guess. These were all the hits that I got back. Radon, heavy metals, pesticides, pathogenic yeast, antibiotic resistant bacteria, tetanus. Wow, soil is a really dangerous place. <laughs> It's not anywhere where you would want your children to play. It's certainly not a place you would want to eat from or work in. That's what the literature tells you. And yet, I felt that was not quite right. And so what did I do? I decided I'd go out and I would learn from the professors of soil. I would do what farmers are or doctors are trained to do, which is internships. But this time, it wasn't going to be in a hospital. It wasn't going to be in a research center. It was going to be on family farms. And the first farm that I went to was in Jubilee, Washington, with Eric and Wendy Hawkinson. Anybody in the room know them? They are biodynamic farmers. I love his t-shirt. You know, when I, when I lecture to non-ranchers and farmers, the room like absolutely cracks up at this. But you guys, do you all own this t-shirt? Is that why? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, to you it's not even funny. It's like that's standard wear, you know. Um, so anyhow, this was the first place I went on my, on my travels. And it really is where I had my lightning bolt moment. And I'd like to tell you about it because to you guys, this is gonna be incredibly obvious, but for me, this was earth changing. So I was sitting there at the table and complimenting Eric on this amazing, gorgeous 12 acre biodynamic farm that just pulls out the most vibrant fruits and vegetables and feeds the entire community through the CSA box and he's got, you know, uh, cows that rotate through all the pastures, and he does it all right. And I was telling him, this place is amazing. And he said to me, well, it wasn't always like this. He said, when I bought the land 20 years ago, this place was a mess. It had been in monoculture, and then kids had ridden dirt bikes over it for years and driven all the topsoil off, and it was a terrible, terrible mess. He was new to farming. And he was a smart guy. He'd gone to Yale Divinity School. What is this with Divinity School and people who are interested in agriculture? I heard someone earlier. He was actually a salmon fisherman for a while. So he went to the textbooks. He went to the agronomy textbooks to figure out what to do. And they told him to do something that you guys always know is, is recommended in conventional agriculture, which is test and replace. And he went around his land, he took test tubes of soil and he sent it off to the lab and then he got these fabulous readouts about all the minerals that were missing. And then he bought the bags of minerals and he dumped them back in the soil. And he was doing this year after year, test and replace. But there was a big problem. The tests were not getting any better. And the replacing part was making him go broke. So, and that wasn't actually the only problems. Eric had a really profound thought. Well, he had two really profound thoughts, but one of them was he started reading, and this was, by the way, for organic farming. He started reading the bag of supplements that he was buying, 
And it actually said on the bag, wear a mask while dispersing these. And he said, well, if these are supposed to be so good for my soil and so good for the people who are going to eat these fruits and vegetables, why do I have to wear a mask? Which I thought was an interesting thought. And then he, saw, he thought, where are these minerals coming from? And he realized that they had to come from somewhere and that they were probably coming from some part of the globe where they needed those minerals way more than he needed them there in Washington state. So he threw the whole model aside and turned to a much more holistic model, which you can call, I've learned, I, I spent some time with Wendell Berry and he's so funny. He's like, holistic, biodynamic, organic, blah, blah, blah. Those are all things you can wear on a t-shirt, he always he told me. He said, what really matters is that it is asking nature what she would do. Exactly what we heard before. What would nature do? And farming within that model and really trying to understand what, what nature would do. And in his case, it was biodynamic. And I think they do some extra things with the horns and, the, and, the, and, and so on. But I, that's, that's outside my purview. I'm sure it works very well. Um, but, Regardless, using the ground cover um, and bringing animals onto the land, using local seeds, preserving water, recycling nutrients, all those things that, that you guys are very savvy about. And all of a sudden, his land started to turn around. So here I am sitting at the dining table with Eric, and I say to him, so what was the secret sauce? What turned your land around? And he looked at me, and he's a really kind guy, and he's very patient. And I could just tell he thought I was a total idiot. He was like, Daphne, don't you get it? It's everything. It's this whole complex web. It's not one thing. It's all these pieces of the worms and the soil and the water and the community and the cows and the this and the that and the that. And he started to you know, explain to me the complicated thing that is this holistic farming. And that was the moment that I realized that, in fact, what I'd been doing all along in my career was testing and replacing. And that I needed to think within that same web-like structure if I was going to take care of my patients and if I was going to understand truly how we, as humans, are connected to soil. So what I'm going to do in the next bit that I have is bring you down that complicated path of really understanding how our health is linked to the health of the soil. Using some complexity thinking, and this is from the British Museum, so I thought it was appropriate to put that up. We should all own one of these. <laughs> Whenever you're starting to think too linear, put this hat on, okay? <laughs> so lesson number one is soil as vitamin. And I think this is all, at this point, been covered. It is pretty intuitive to you, but does anybody here know John Reginald up in Washington State University? He's a very interesting, smart guy. And he's been doing some work that I think, you know, within his field, it's a little controversial, but he is starting to span disciplines in a way that I feel is very, very valuable. So what John did was he did two test plots of strawberries in Watsonville. One which was basically organic, ecological, what have you, and one that was conventional. And he went in and he actually looked at the microbia in the soil in both of these test plots, which I know many of you have done in this room as well. What was interesting was that he actually did 16S RNA sequencing, which is a way of going in that we have now, that we have these you know, hyper-advanced techniques, and actually identifying the signatures, the individual signatures of each type of bacteria. So you can really get a sense, not just like the, with the microscope we heard about yesterday, where you can see gram-positive, gram-negative, flagella. You know, you can sort of get big families. With 16 sRNA, you can actually get down and really understand the species, the variety that you're, you're dealing with. So he did this in these two strawberry plots. And guess what he found? So the blue line is the separation between the two plots on the graph. And everything above that blue line is, represents a type of bacteria that was found in the organic field. And everything below that blue line shows a unique type. This isn't quantity, guys. This is types of bacteria that were found in the conventional field. So what, what do you see? 
Shout it out. Biodiversity in the organic field. You see, it's like an international city. It's like London, okay? Where there's people of all colors and shapes and from all parts of the world and it's just incredibly diverse. Below the blue line in that conventional field, it's like a country club where everybody's named Chad. I don't know. <laughs> it's incredibly homogeneous, all right? So that is what he found. Now, John did something next that I don't think anybody else has done and that really needs to happen. He went back and he linked that biodiversification. Is there a Chad in the room? <laughs> oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I like the name Chad, too. I don't know why that came to mind. But he, he, he linked that biodiversification with nutrient value in the fruits. And what did he find? And this was after one growing season, okay? He found that the organic fruits had much higher vitamin C and phenolic and so on, significantly higher, like 10%. And that's after one growing season, guys. And what he's finding is with it, each successive season in more microbial diversity, as it, as it comes up, you get more and more nutrient value. So he really was able to go from the micro in the soil to the nutrient value of these foods that we're eating and really understand that there is a connection there. And so we have soil as vitamin. This map marches out in many other contexts. One of my internships was on a laying egg farm and it was an amazing experience because it was a side-by-side -side farm of free-range organic, by the way, guys, on the left. And pasture on the right, that's what free-range organic looks like for anybody who doesn't know. They're eating organic and they're free, kind of. Um, but this research just came out of Italy looking at the nutrient value in these eggs. And what do you see? Conventional and organic for vitamin E, beta carotene, lutein, and zeaxanthin are about the same. Organic means nothing in terms of nutrient value. But once you get on pasture, once you connect them back to the soil, Everything just pops. That's where it happens. And the same for all these, these uh, nutrients that we need for brain functioning. It's literally pasture to brain. Okay, these were all higher as well. DHA, I think it's hysterical that if you feed supplemental DHA to hens, you can put on the egg carton DHA enhanced, but it's much less DHA in those eggs than hens who have eaten on pasture. But you're not allowed to say DHA enhanced from pasture it, it, it raised eggs, which I think is so interesting. So there, this is the nutrient flow from soil to microbe to plant, and then of course to us. Lesson number two is soil as metabolic regulator. Okay, now you're like, oh, this is sounding like a doctor getting into Dr. E's here. But you talk about me metabolic regulators in, in agriculture as well. It's something that somehow informs the way the systems in your body are working or your digestion. And um, to understand this, we actually need to sort of mush together. We're doing crowdsource research here of Carlotta De Filippo, who's in Florence, and Jan Hendrik, who's um, actually at MIT right now. And what Carlotta De Filippo did was she actually went and collected stool samples from kids in Florence and in Burkina Faso, in a very remote village there, where they're doing um, basically holistic farming. And she looked at, once again, doing 16 sRNA, looked at the microbial communities in these two stool, groups of uh, stool. And once again, what do you think she found? She found way more biodiversity in the Burkina Faso kids' stool, but she also found way more Bactroidetes, which are a kind of bacterium which are really good at extracting nutrients from high fiber foods and greens and grains and so on. What she found in the kids from Florence were actually a lot more firmicutes, which are really good at extracting nutrients basically from Pop-Tarts and sugar. So, um, you know, this started to lead to this really interesting 
question of what's the chicken and the egg here? Is it the food that these kids are eating that's changing the microflora? Or when you look at these bacteroidetes, guess what they're most similar to? Soil bacteria. Is it the actual soil itself that is informing the biome of these children's guts? Well, we don't know the answer, but here is the third piece of research from Jen Heinrich that's starting to give us a clue. And what he did, am I moving too fast here, or is this? Okay. So this is the third piece that's amazing, where he actually was studying an enzyme which is in a bacteria, which once again was one of those Bacteroidetes bacteria, that lives on seaweed. And this bacteria is really, really good at extracting nutrients from seaweed. That's its job. And they looked at where they found that same bacterial sequence within the whole animal kingdom, and guess where they found it? They found it in the intestines, in the microbiome, of people from Asian company, uh, countries who eat a lot of seaweed. So what, is, what we're starting to see is this microbial or DNA transfer that happens between the places where our food is grown and our own microbiome, and it's informing how good we are at digesting our food. So literally, our soil is teaching our own system how, how to behave. So lesson number three, uh, we're going to move on, is soil as immune support. And to gather this lesson, we're going to go to the Ozarks, OK? And this is Cody Holmes. Anybody know Cody Holmes? He writes for Acres as well. Um, another holistic rancher and a total character. And I went and I uh, spent some time with Cody working with him. He's, he's another fence mover, I call him. And, um, <laughs> And he's so funny, Cody, because he's got so much free time on his hands that all he does is he spends time on Facebook harassing other farmers and trying to get them to change. So um, and he's, he's great. He actually came out with me to Alan's uh, uh, fundraiser in California. I, I was so proud that I imported my own rancher, you know. So, so, so Cody was a conventional rancher, injecting everything he could into his cattle. Um, he had some issues, though. One of them was he was going broke. Um, the other issue was that each year when it came time to inject the, whatever you guys used to inject, you know, the ones who were conventional and giving them all the antibiotics and the hormones, he would keep one aside. And that's the one he would feed to his own family. <laughs> and he realized that there was some serious issues there. So he started to follow Alan's work and Andre Voisin and all the, all the people who he completely admired and changed, went cold turkey and changed his ranch. And as I was there working with Cody, he told me, you know, the most amazing thing that happened when I switched over is basically all of the illness went away. And especially, he said, the upper respiratory diseases. He said a lot of like what sounded to me like cow allergy and cow asthma and rhinoviruses and what have you. He said all of that disappeared. And I thought that was so interesting. And I said to him, well, what do you think the cause was? And he said, well, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure that it has to do with all those microorganisms in the soil. Now, Cody's a smart guy, but he's not a biomedical expert. And so I needed to check this out. So here's Cody. I guess that's another thing all you ranchers do. You spend a lot of time on your knees looking at your grass. Is that right? Because I saw a lot of picture of the same picture this week. So, um, so anyway, to check out Cody, I flew to Munich, Germany. And I spent time with this woman, Erika von Mutius, who at this point is incredibly famous because she's published in, at least within the medical world, she's published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And what's so funny is she's this completely prim and proper woman. But you know, you have all these hippie home birth moms that are following her. And she just can't believe it. You know, she's just like the most, you know, like she's got the pin tie and whatever. It's just this, this is funny contrast. But she's doing this incredible work, trying to understand why it is that farm kids who are late, raised on holistic farms have virtually or very little asthma or allergy. 
And when I asked Erica, so what is it? What is the reason why you're finding this farm effect? She went over to her computer and sat down, and she pulled up this image. She said, need I explain more? It's all here on this Bav Bavarian farm. And I was like, what, the baby that's about to be killed by the cow? I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's like, if it survives that, it won't have any problems down the road. But you know, for me, this is amazing. Because in medicine, what is another term, sort of the colloquial term for allergy? What do we say? What do we call allergy? Hay fever. And what's this mother doing? She's like throwing hay in the air, for goodness sakes. And yes, that can of highly pasteurized, homogenized, vitamin D added milk over there on the side, and uh, all the, you know, the, the clean floor, you know, what, what, this seemed to me to be a disaster area, you know? But no, in fact, this is all the protective medicine, and this is all the research that in this, this you know, was four or five years ago, and the ensuing time that has come out showing how it is early exposure to this incredible biodiversity of microbes that actually is protective. So this is one of the things that really troubled Dr. Van Mutius, though, because she's a really smart researcher. And she said, well, I have to compare these two locations, like the messy urban apartment and the farm. So she went with her sampling kits, and she went and she collected all this you know, dust and stuff from each place. And she found almost as much bacteria in that urban apartment as she did on the farm. So what was so protective about the farm? Well, this graph, and you can let your eyes cross, and I'll just explain it to you. Basically, the red line shows, uh, if you think of the y-axis as being a measurement of diversity, the red line shows biodiversity in the urban asthmatics versus the blue line shows biodiversity on kids on farms. So the biodiversity, it wasn't number of bacteria, it was variety of bacteria that truly made the protective difference. Once again, biodiversity. And of fungi as well, not just bacteria. So you have this incredible immune support connection between, um, between uh, the soil and our own microbiome. And that really seems to be this constant dynamic communication again that is really causing this kind of immune support. It's not between our own cells. It's between the, the cells in the environment and the microbia living within us. We're actually doing very little. Our own immune systems aren't even so great. <laughs> it really is depending on all these little creatures. So this is the sad thing. When you take the, the, the 50,000 foot view on this and look at biodiversity on this planet, and look at rates of asthma and allergy. And by the way, this graph could be Crohn's disease. It could be inflammatory, other forms of inflammatory bowel. It could be rheumatoid arthritis. I mean, it could even be cardiovascular disease or diabetes. What we're seeing is as biodiversity goes down, these diseases are all going up. It really is soil and environment as medicine and here in this incredible transfer of immunity. So I'll let you guys pick which medicine you want out of the cabinet here. The one on the left or the one on the right? All right, lesson number four, soil as community medicine. And what's interesting is, I don't know if we've really talked about this so directly in the last two days, but it's been kind of implicit in every single talk that's been given. And that, for me, has been one of the most exciting things that I've heard. There was one speaker here who's really focusing on it in terms of understanding systems of change within farmers and what it is that makes a difference. But this idea of soil as community medicine is, I think, maybe the most fundamental one. It really is the tie that binds. And the place that I went to learn this was in the Bronx in the Mid-Bronx, to be exact. Anybody here from the Mid-Bronx? Anybody been to the Mid-Bronx? A couple of people have been to the Mid-Bronx. This is Karen Washington, who's very famous, actually, in urban farming in general. She was in, she's like the Alan Savory of urban farming, you know? 
She's a really um, been an incredible innovator. And she said she's really one of the first people to introduce the idea that you could have a whole bunch of community gardens and put them together, and that qualifies as a farm. And you can really start a farming system within the community. And she, didn't, she really started to transform these vacant lots, lots in the Bronx, which were hotbeds for crime and trash and um, you know, vermin, <laughs> and she started to transform them into community gardens. And not only that, she built a farmer's market around it, which me meets in front of Tremont Park every Tuesday. You can go Tuesday, mid-Bronx, in front of Tremont Park, and buy stuff from La Familia Verde Community Gardens. So when I went and started to work with Karen initially, I was very much on this sort of food as medicine jag, and I, I sort of, I thought that the reason that we had urban farming was to bring food to communities that otherwise didn't have access to it. Well, it turns out that that's a little piece of what it does. It helps to irrigate food deserts, so to speak, and really helps sort of balance um, the equation a little bit. But that's only a little way that urban farming keeps a community happy, healthy. And as I started to work with this woman, Jill Litt, who's a researcher at the University of Colorado, who's a PhD in the, universe, in the department, in the School of Public Health, but studying urban gardening as if it were a pill, okay? Really trying to understand its impact on health. And what she has found and her colleagues around the country have found is that it's linked to all kinds of other outcomes independent. So when you do the statistical analyses, it's not that urban gardeners are likely to be healthier to start with. It really is the urban gardening itself that has this impact. It leads to better health for seniors, lower asthma rates. You can understand why that's the case now that I gave you that other data, right? Better school performance. It turns out that kids with ADD, you stick them in a green setting, all of a sudden they get hyper-focused, you know? They're able to, less obesity, less alcoholism, greater collective efficacy. Collective efficacy is a community, is a measurement of the community's belief that they can make a difference. And it turns out that that's one of the most powerful health indicators for a community. Less crime within, sometimes as far as, some of the studies have shown as far as a mile from these community gardens. More economic opportunity and better self-rated health, which is in fact the best predictor of your health. So if you have a poor opinion of your health, change it right now, okay? <laughs> So there you go, community health, which is soil connecting to people. Now, this last one, I don't even need to go through these slides with you folks, because this is really what we've been talking about the last uh, couple days. But when I talk to medical audiences, I am, well, first of all, there's just a blank stare on this one. But then also, I get letters afterwards saying things like, that was awfully political of you to talk about soil as an earth healer, which is so crazy. But anyhow, let me tell you about this. I mean, I just, it, it, you guys are, it's like speaking to family here, you know, it's just very easy for me to tell these stories. So let's go back to that egg farm here, okay? This is the, this is the aerial view of it. And these are the Cox brothers. They're in Arkansas. They started off on the left with five conventional egg houses. First is conventional, then they moved to free range organic. Then they saw the light, and they're moving the pasture. I'm sure that Joel's looking at this, and he says it's still a disaster. It's basically an egg monoculture. But, you know, it's progress. They're selling the Whole Foods under the Vital Farms label. It's progress. It's progress. But I show this slide to medical audiences basically so that they can begin to understand which one of these two areas is more likely to move carbon into the ground versus up to the air, methane into the ground, up to the air. And believe it or not, this is like revolutionary for them, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I know I don't, like I quiz them, I quiz the audience, which one of these two places is more likely to move carbon down? You get like the split, you know, like people just don't even know, you know? I sometimes put a golf course up there, they get really confused, like they have no idea. So, um, <laughs> I know, don't you love my outfit, by the way? Yes. Do you make people wear that when they come on your farm, Joel? 
No? OK. I actually had to wear three different ones on this egg farm. I had to take them off, put them on, take them off. It was really exciting. You don't have to walk through sheep dip across the map. <laughs> I couldn't figure out if they were trying to protect the hens from me or me from the hens. But whatever. All right. So, so anyhow, this is the data on this. And I, I, I think it's important to put that up there, because what this data is is linking microbial activity in the soil to carbon sequestration. And what they're finding is that in the best managed soils, it's six times the amount that's moving in as compared to the worst, time, the worst soil. I mean, this is amazing stuff. For those of us who are not in this field, this is, this is the hallelujah, you know? So, um, and this is another piece of data that is actually from, um, I think, Switzerland. It's looking at farming models and comparing them to both microbial diversity and carbon content. And you see that as you get more ecological, more holistic, in this case, they're calling it biodynamic, but it really is just holistic farming plus the horns. But um, <laughs> I love, I'm actually keynoting the annual biodynamic conference. And I love biodynamics. But um, so, uh, but I, I am a woman of science, sadly. It's a, um, so anyhow, what it shows is that it does, it really does all, it, it marches through and it all makes sense. But as one of the earlier speakers said, I want to give these talks to the disbelievers. And I want to give these talks to people who don't believe that climate change is even happening. And I want to give them something to care about. So, oh, by the way, I put Cody up there as an earth doctor. So that's when I put up this slide that you've already seen. I say, don't even worry about carbon counts. Just worry about number one, OK? You don't have to worry past your own nose. Just put the best thing into your body. And guess what? It's going to be the best thing for the planet. And this data really shows it. Healthy soil, it is what connects healthy people and healthy planet. So in the few minutes that I have left, what I want to do is quickly show you how this might actually march out in a model, OK? So as we see, soil as vitamin, metabolic support, immune support, community medicine, earth healer, soil as medicine. And in order to show you this, um, this is a place that I was just at, so I'm just adding this on. You got, I have never showed this to anybody before. You guys are the first crew to see this. And I'm calling it Applied Pharmacology. <laughs> and it takes place right here on the border between Finland and Russia in South Karelia. And I was just there before coming to the UK. And the reason I went there was because of this research that's being done by this group of researchers in Finland that's basically showing that kids in Finland have four times the amount of allergy as kids who are right over the border in Russia. Now, this is confusing because if you remember, I don't remember if you know your World War II history, but the, all of that used to be part of Finland before the Russians came in the next half of it. So genetically, this is the same group of people. And even custom-wise, a lot of it's the same. So we know that it's not genes. And actually, the landscape, the geography is the same. So we know it's not that either. And so this, these researchers have really realized that it's the way, in fact, that the soil and the microorganisms are being managed and the exposure to these that really are making the difference. And this is two of the lead researchers. And what's so phenomenal about this picture is that's me in the middle, in case you didn't recognize me. I am standing there between an ecologist and an MD. Now, I don't know if you guys realize that, but that's amazing. Because that rarely happens. We were earlier, someone was talking about being interdisciplinary, and that means getting a soil biologist and an agronomist and a blah, blah, blah. But actually getting the two worlds to meet is something we all need to start doing, the health world and the agriculture world. And this, or the soil science world. So that's Tari, that's Tari Hatala on my right. And see, he's a big dude in the hospital. He's head of asthma and allergy for Helsinki Children's Hospital. You can see his picture behind. You know, he's like Louis XIV there. And on the other side is Ilka Hansky, who is very famous for developing the metagenomic theory in ecology with butterflies. 
And they are collaborating on this research in Finland. And what they've done is something that no one has ever done before. They have gone from the macro to the micro, collecting everything from, you know, uh, superimposing everything from land use types to going on to these kids' skin in Russia and Finland and collecting microflora and doing 16S RNA analysis. And they're sticking all this stuff together and trying to make this composite picture of what is going on. And they're finding that once again, it's this predominance of certain kinds of soil bacteria that are there more in Russia than, than are in Finland that are making the difference. And the reason, to put it simply, is because Finland has gotten too clean. So as a result of this, oh, this is me and my family trying to make it to Russia on bicycles, by the way. They wouldn't let us over the border. We wanted to go see what was happening on the other side, but it was, there, was, there, was a lot of, um, there was a lot of do not cross. So um, <laughs> you need three weeks of visa and blah, blah, blah. We tried to do it at night so they wouldn't see us, but <laughs> <laughs> anyhow. You see that, it literally was a kilometer that way to Svetgorska, Svetgorska, whatever you pronounce it, but uh, and that we were still standing in Finland. Um, but this is the Allergy Research Institute that is really starting to apply these principles to try and change the allergy rates within Finland. So how are they doing it? This is uh, Kimo Saarinen, who's one of, he's actually an ecologist by training, but now working within allergy and asthma. And they're doing it through trying to bring biodiversity back to their pastures. And they're doing that through bringing in sheep and so on and doing, trying to do more of the mob grazing. This is one of their test fields. What they've realized hilariously is that where they have the most biodiversity right now is on their roadsides where they're mowing twice a year. So they're really just doing exactly what sheep do. And they've published a whole series of papers on this, which is just, it's like you find the answers in the most unlikely places. Like you're supposed to stick the kids on the roadside so that they can get more exposure. <laughs> but you see, see their forests? That's how everything is in Finland, totally managed. The same, the same um, elder everywhere. So elder allergy, or birch, sorry, this is birch. The same birch allergy is every child lights up to birch because that's all they're exposed to. There isn't any diversity, not just in microbia, but of plants as well. They're starting this campaign, the, the Kiss Your Pig campaign. This is part of what they're doing. They're trying to get people off the fast food. You want to go back? You, you need a photo there, yeah. <laughs> I think that this is actually Atari Hatala's grandchild. Um, they're, they're trying to get rid of all the junk. They're trying to get rid of all the crazy phobias. Like everybody thinks they have a gluten allergy in that country because they're just feeling allergic. So I mean, it's hysterical. They put their gluten under glass in the hotels, you know, like it's some kind of dangerous animal. Um, but you know. You know, but they're trying to change the whole mindset. This is something that they're bringing back. Does anybody know what this is? What is it? Berry, berry. berry picker. Like in the States, we'd be like, oh, uh, uh. They sell these in your five and dime store. They're trying to get, and the, I just was walking in the woods and came across this. I think it's so funny they are wearing their bike helmets to pick berries, but, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a dangerous pursuit. They're very careful in Finland, okay? <laughs> um, but anyhow, they're bringing back uh, birch pollen and honey. They're trying, so what are we talking about here? We're talking, oh, they're trying to get people to drink water that is actually from a stream. Because that's one of the things they've realized from Russia, or well water. Yeah, you get a little bit of the squishies, you know, but um, you know, there's, there's a lot of good, and they realize that that's what people used to do. They drank their own well water. But what we're talking about here is not a pill or one intervention. It's an incredibly complicated web of how we have to bring people back into the soil and into the land. And for anybody who is still a doubter in some way or another who you need to talk to about this. You need to start, oh, well, this is what we need to do, is start bringing the earth scientists, and we already talked about this. But for anybody who's a doubter, 
you need to start showing them these images. Or this image. This is a cross-section of our intestine and a cross-section of soil. Or go down to the microbial level. Can you even tell which one of those is the bacteria dancing with the roots of the plants? And is, are the bacteria dancing with the villa in our intestine? You can't. These are the same systems. Because guess what? We are soil. Thank you so much. All right, guys, so it's time for breakout. So I apologize for the confusion yesterday. So I thought I would try to simplify it today and put it up here and we'll just, we're gonna walk through each one real quick so everybody knows what's available to them. So first off, we have Elaine Ingham who gave that amazing, fascinating talk yesterday on what's in the soil. So she's gonna be upstairs in the Blue Room, Beaumont. Trey Cates is gonna be doing, he's our COO at Savory Institute. He's gonna be going over what does it mean to be a savory hub. We've talked throughout the conference about these hub leaders. If you would like to know more about that, what they're doing, maybe interested in being involved your, on your own, go ahead and check out what Trey's doing. He's upstairs in Prescott, which is the first room on the left after you get out of the lift. Uh, Owen Hablutzel, who introduced Darren Doherty yesterday, works with holistic management and permaculture, kind of putting them together, also works all over the world. Um, is gonna be in Sydney upstairs. Courtney White, who just wrote the book Grass Soil Hope, it's available outside uh, at, the, um, at the bookstore. Uh, he will be upstairs in Harley. That's gonna be a really good one. Seth Itzkin, who did, uh, who, um, and Jason Roundtree, I'm sorry, I forgot to put Jason's name there. They're gonna do citizen science and conventional science view of climate change. So Jason and Seth sat on the panels with Peter Bick. If you saw both of those, uh, you would have caught them. And, and they're gonna do a really interesting talk on, on uh, how livestock can relate to carbon and then ultimately climate change. They're Bartholomew upstairs. Dr. Natasha Campbell McBride, I wanna make sure we take some special time to talk about her. Uh, she lives here in the UK and has her clinic in Oxford. And she's a neurologist from Russia who has created the GAPS diet. And she's gonna have some fascinating stuff, similar to some of the stuff that Daphne's talking about, of the connection between soil and our guts, and then, uh, and then ultimately our overall well-being. That one's gonna be fascinating. Uh, we didn't have time in the way the schedule allowed to get her up on the main stage, but she really is incredible. So uh, be sure and check her out. That's gonna be in America, uh, which is downstairs. Uh, Brittany Cole Bush, who we saw in the panel yesterday that I hosted with the producers, the young woman that's doing the um, sheep herding in the Bay Area in San Francisco. She is also gonna be downstairs in Ludgate. And then Sarah Fergoso, who is the author of Everyday Paleo, is going to be doing a cooking demo in here uh, with some lamb chops. And then right after that, when we all reconvene, you wanna be on time, because we're gonna do the butchery demo with a half a beef. So that's, that's kind of the rundown for the next couple of hours. Uh, so Sarah's gonna be in here. And then uh, we're gonna go, go find your breakout sessions, and then we'll have a break afterwards. All right, thanks guys.